Welcome back to From the Bridge. I'm your host and concierge, Rick Jones, the captain of Fishbait Solutions. You know, we talk a lot about fans and fandom and and their communities, their tribes, uh, and nothing indicates this better than licensed merchandise. You know, those shirts, car flags, and logoed pop-up tents with team marks on them. We like to wear our tribal gear. So today we'll take a look at the industry of licensed products. My special guest is Dave Kirkpatrick of the Collegiate Licensing Agency, CLC, who knows so much about licensed products. We'll also jump back up on the soapbox and tell you about another terrific place to eat on the road with Rick. So put on your school's gear and get ready to rumble. It's another edition of From the Bridge. Someone once said, you are what you wear. (laughs) As we uh, collectively wear a whole lot of things that indicate which teams we support or what music artists we like or what sporting equipment company we prefer or even what polo shirt we like best. Again, we are what we wear. I love to go to games and see thousands of fans wearing their school colors. I love those special games with whiteouts or blackouts or those games where certain sections of the stadium are in one color and the section next to them is in a second color. Gives you that kind of pinstripe uh, view. I like all that. We previously have talked uh, with Bill Battle, the founder of CLC, and really kind of the father of collegiate licensing. Before CLC, universities were receiving absolutely nothing from companies selling merchandise with their marks. Today, they are in some cases creating millions of dollars for the use of their marks. I also believe that CLC's aggressive and successful journey for college licensing led to more robust licensing programs for professional sports teams and leagues. Now, my son is a huge Atlanta Falcons fan, and he has several Falcons outfits for his new baby boy. Plus, he and his wife, Celia, wear their Falcon jerseys when they go to games or even when they watch games on television. Bill Battle's new book, The Master's Plan, goes into great detail about how and with whom they grew the collegiate licensing business with schools, retailers, and even licensees like Nike and Starter, Electronic Arts, and others. I lived and worked a few years in England and loved how the soccer fans wore their colors with shirts, hats, and scarves of their favorite team. And we're now seeing that with MLS teams in our own country. But it's much larger than just apparel. We have team car pennants, team branded tailgating products like tents, chairs, coolers, and picnic products. We have branded posters, home flags, koozies and cups, and everything in between. At Fishbait, we're working on two new licensing concepts that we hope will be big successes. One in college sports with what we feel is a significantly undervalued product and one in country music to better engage with those fans. Now, I'm not going to tip my hand on either of these, but watch us to see how we do in this area going forward. You are what you wear, and you are wearing those tribal symbols like never before. And for those of us in the sports and entertainment business, we thank you. My guest is my old pal, Dave Kirkpatrick of CLC. Dave oversees non-apparel licensing for the largest collegiate licensing firm in the world and has forgotten more about licensing than most of us know. I'm so excited to welcome him to From the Bridge. Hey, Dave, welcome to the show. Good morning, Rick. Thank you for having me on the bridge. We're excited. Uh, I, I start with almost every guest with a little bit of, you know, Where'd you grow up? Uh, Where'd you go to college? What was your first job? Some of that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I grew up in Denver, Colorado, and I went to boarding school, went to the Taft School in Connecticut, and then uh, on to Denison University, 
Granville, Ohio. And I graduated in 93, and, and about three days after I graduated, I started up with uh, McCann Erickson Event Marketing. And McCann Erickson is an advertising agency, and this was the event arm that was based in St. Louis. And um, the first project was the Sports Illustrated Sport Festival, which was a seven-month tour. Um, our client was Time Warner, who at the time owned Sports Illustrated and Six Flags theme parks. So we toured the the seven Six Flags theme parks, um, and we had a hundred thousand square feet of sports. We had eight tractor trailers. We'd set up. We'd we'd build it. We'd staff it with local high school kids. Tear it down on to the next city. So it was a great job out of college. Um, but after about fifteen months full time on the road with various festivals and at events, um, I said, hey, I, I need to pick a city, establish some roots. And um, and we had opened in Atlanta. And uh, so this is now sort of September of 94. I really liked the city. Uh, I knew I wanted to work on the business side of sports. I didn't really know in what capacity, um, but the Olympics were coming to Atlanta. I knew some people at Turner Sports. And then I had met Bill Battle through a friend of mine that was working for the Battles. So I, I went home, picked up my stuff, packed up the Azusa Rodeo, drove to Atlanta, crossed my fingers, and, and hoped that things would work out. You know, it's interesting, a couple of things. One, you know, you met, we talked earlier uh, before the show started about Kimberly Bowden, who'd been on our, our show, and, you know, she did the same thing. She was a Florida girl that just said, I'm just going to pack up and go to Atlanta. <laughs> and, I love that story. You know, I, I had no idea of her Disney background. Yeah, but I mean, story. but I just love the fact that, you know, you should have the guts. And I have worked for with a woman named Lisa Murray. Lisa, who's been on the show, is the the chief marketing officer for Octagon, and she was my partner early on. And I actually met her at Conan Wolf when she worked on the Six Flags business. But she was a girl from Long Island that went to Delaware, and she had a girlfriend that said, let's move to Atlanta. And they just moved to Atlanta, and she ended up getting a job. But you talk about the, the tour with uh, Sports Illustrated and, uh, and Six Flags and, then, and that being McCann of events. I had Steve Robinson on from uh, Chick-fil-A on a couple of shows, and mm -hmm. he worked at Six Flags – but he also, uh, his agency was McCann Erickson. Clisby Clark okay. in Atlanta was yep, just exactly. a legendary ad man. And he talked about all the great things that uh, that, that uh, Clisby did for Six Flags and everything. So, you know, it's interesting when we get in and we look back over the kind of the course of the three years we've been doing this podcast, so many intersections of people right. and places. And, and, you know, it's all, I tell young people all the time, do not burn a bridge. You're going, <laughs> you're going to meet that person. You're going back over that at some point. So now you're in Atlanta and you've met Bill Battle. Then did you go to work for CLC? Yeah. So, um, it took a couple months, but, um, I wound up getting hired by Bill to work on the, the non-collegiate side of the company, which was called Battle Enterprises. And so y'all had NASCAR, you had the PGA Tour. You, right. You had Churchill Downs at one point, didn't you? We had Churchill yep. Downs. We did the, the Paralympics, okay. um, the 96 Paralympics. Yep. yep. So I started on, on NASCAR Properties, which was um, the NASCAR bar logo, and then we had six ISC tracks. Growing up in Denver, I knew next to nothing about NASCAR, but I, I knew – that it was on the rise and uh, I really liked the battles a lot. And um, so I was excited. This is, this is December 94, full speed ahead. Our first job, we go down to the Daytona 500 and uh, we learn about three, four days into it that NASCAR was going to be taking their program in house. Uh, so rather than, you know, pay a commission to battle enterprise. Hey, we're going to staff up. We're going to move it to Charlotte, put it under George Pine and Bill Seaborn. And so, wow, I'm, I'm 60 days into this. And suddenly our main client is going in a different direction. Uh, a little scary. Um, Bill came down, did everything we could to salvage the business, but they said, Hey, this is, this is the way we're going to go. Let's wrap up 1995 and then, and then we'll move it to Charlotte. Um, they offered Charlie and I uh, positions with NASCAR, but we both turned it down and met with uh, Bill and Pat. 
And Pat started describing the direction he wanted to go with CLC and, and start some new departments, retail marketing, promotional licensing. And so um, I moved over to the CLC side. We sort of wrapped up NASCAR. I was sort of 50-50 for a period of time. And then sort of early 96, I'm, I'm full-time CLC in the, in the retail marketing side of the company. You know, when I talked to Bill recently, he, he talked about how his role was to make sure that the schools were happy and that he spent most of his time with those relationships, but that Pat had a unique view of the marketing side. You know, Pat right. kind of saw the potential of, of where the licensing business could go for both the, the retail channels and the licensee, but also what the consumer was going to want. That's right. Um, That's and, right. And so you were kind of right on the cusp of that. Um, yeah, I mean, from what I understand, and, and I I hope everyone will go read Bill's book, The Master yeah, Plan. Yeah, so good. And, and, and it's your, so good, yeah. Your two interviews with Bill were so special. Um, but, uh, you know, as you read through it, through, through the, the company started in 81, and, and through the 80s it was really a, a legal and an administrative entity. And then um, you get into the early 90s, and suddenly Run DMC is wearing Georgetown stuff and Raiders stuff. And, and sports license starts becoming less of a fan item and more of a, a fashion item. And I, I give Pat a lot of credit for saying the company needs to, needs to change, and we need to be less – Yes, the administrative and legal is always going to be the backbone of what we do, but we need to bring in some people with sort of a marketing vision. And uh, so, yeah, early on, you could just sort of feel the company changing, and, and suddenly the the numbers are growing, and it really was an exciting time as we're signing independent schools um, and some, you know, long time, you know, the Texases and Notre Dames that everybody thought would be independent forever start coming into the fold and, um, you know, it, it, we're growing their business very rapidly and, and paying for our services <clears throat> with audit recoveries, you know, let alone everything else. And uh, it was just a super exciting time to be a part of CLC because we, we were all just looking around saying, hey, this, this could be a place to really build an exciting career. Um, special times. Well, you also had this, this little – television production company up in Bristol, Connecticut, you know, <laughs> come along at the same time exactly. that suddenly, you know, we were inundated with sport. And because of the sheer amount of volume of collegiate sports, it, it, it was the backbone of ESPN. You know, I, you know, I, I give Dave Gavin a lot of credit. You know, he creates the Big East literally out of nothing. I mean, there were a bunch of independent schools and he put it all together but the real key was i think his his initial contract w with big monday and the big east you know game of the week at a time that you had all those great personalities coaching yes. you know like john thompson and raleigh massimino and Bayheim and just so many others and so that's you know you talked about you, you know the 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 rap artists wearing georgetown stuff i mean it just all was just kind of that unique intersection at the right time, I, you know, Bill talks about the master's plan about just all these forks in the road that came, you know, to him that you look back and go, man, how did that happen? I mean, how, yeah. you know, and, and all that. And I know one of the things that you got involved in, you know, early on was what we call non apparel licensing. I mean, you began right. to see, you know, whether that was trading cards or video games or, you know, you know, uh, tailgating products. Talk a little bit about that because initially, yeah. you know, licensing had been shirts, <laughs> right? Essentially, right. and now we have this just complete metamorphosis. Talk about that. That's right. Yeah. So I was on the retail marketing side, and and along with Kit Walsh and Scott Buyak and and some of those guys, and and all, 100 percent of our focus was the apparel. And then, meanwhile, the, the non-apparel division, which was run by Tammy Donnan. It wasn't getting really any marketing support, um, and and it was pretty basic categories. It's, it's drinkware, it's sporting goods, it's school supplies, class rings. But we all felt like, um, you know, th this is kind of a sleeping giant. 
Um, EA Sports was getting into the video game space. Uh, we're starting to get into trading cards. So I wrote Bill and Pat a letter, uh, worked on that letter for about three months uh, and thought a lot about it. And Bill was big on, Bill was big on the written word. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, that's one of the, I think a lot of people have lost the ability to write a letter, a succinct letter. And Bill talks about how that was so important. So I find it interesting that that's the way you decided to communicate this idea. Well, I I did. And, and I, and I also had to think about it, you know, am I, am I, this career suicide here? Because everything was apparel. And I said, but I, I really thought there was a chance to, to, you know, take, put more time and energy into non-apparel. And so um, they agreed with it. And, and Tammy and I um, sort of started co-running non-apparel and we split up the categories. And uh, I started spending a lot more time in video games, trading cards, certain things. And, uh, it was, it was exciting. And, and, uh, as I look back on it, I, I think it wound up being one of the smarter things I've done in my, my career. Well, I watched game day recently when they were at Ole Miss for the Texas A&M game. And they did a whole bunch of features that morning in the Grove. And right. it was staggering to see the number of items that had, school marks on them i yeah. mean you know picnic wear glassware like you mentioned um vases uh tents chairs coolers yeah. koozies uh, you know what y'all ultimately did was took advantage of what i call the lifestyle um right and that there was this this desire to be all things about my tribe and um and so, you, you know, the market said, we will buy that. But, but let's talk about, I like to talk about challenges. How did you get retailers to pivot and to carry merchandise? Well, in, in the start, um, as I said, there was really no retail marketing department at CLC. We, we had a sort of a glorified signage division where if, if Kmart said, Hey, we want, you know, generic college shines. I mean, we would, we would laminate them and send them. And, um, but Pat's vision and, and Kit Walsh and, and others was let's really go out and build relationships with these retail buyers and the marketing groups. And we've got access to tickets and to, um, cheerleader appearances and, uh, you know, certain things that can hopefully, incent these guys to not only bring in more product, but put it in a higher profile area in the store and, and hopefully sell through. And, uh, you know, the vision is, is really to be partners with our licensees. The, the, the better they do, the better the schools do, the better CLC does. And so that, that is one of the really neat parts of, of our job is, is, you know, we're all pulling in the same direction and we all share in, in our collective successes. You know, I talk a lot about living on a tidal river and that, you know, the tide, you know, all boats rise with the tide. If you create a tide, big boats, little boats, everybody, I'm looking at some intersections. I kind of think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but right at this junction to when you've got, you know, y'all having a different mindset, about retail and marketing. You got ESPN blowing up college sports. <clears throat> Didn't, wasn't this the era of the super show too, where suddenly y- you had these gigantic yes. sporting goods kind of trade shows that allowed you to, yes. in a sort of way, do one-stop shopping. In other words, and I, and I think a lot of these super shows were in Atlanta. The super show was in Atlanta I think it, um, the last Super Show was around 97, and, and sort of the heyday of the Super Show was maybe a little before my time. Okay. But, um, but it, it evolved into new shows, and, and, uh, and now the, 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 the sports licensing and tailgate show is basically the, the little brother of, of the Super Show. It's in Las Vegas, third week in January, and it's a, it's a must-attend um, for the whole sports industry, all the leagues are there, all the major brands. And you're right. It's, it's, um, it's an incredible opportunity over the course of three days to, um, show off your products, talk about, um, promotions and, you know, really put your best foot forward for the, for the industry. 
I know that my buddy Terry Lefton at Sports Business Journal every year covers that show, and, and he has a, an article, I guess, the last week of January, the first week of February, where he talks about all the things he saw. Yeah. You, know, you know, what's new, what's trending, who's going in a direction. You know, Bill talked a lot about, um, with me, and his book talked a lot about some of these interesting brands that came along, Starter being one. Uh, you mentioned Electronic Arts being another that were just juggernauts in terms of, of you know, I think during that period you started thinking, you know, maybe we shouldn't license everybody. Right. Maybe we should pick, you know, one horse and really back that horse and, and, and try to grow their brand versus, hey, let's take 20 different licensees and hope it works. Talk, talk a little bit right. about how that changed a little bit. Well, one thing that's that's unique about college as compared to the professional leagues is every university is independent of each other, and they make their own decisions. Um, CLC, we make no decisions. It's it's our job to facilitate the process and really to react to the university's philosophy. And so, you know, we've got some schools that start going in the direction of less is more, and um, you know, this is. We, we, we want to have a, a we want to really elevate our brand and license fewer companies. We had other co- schools, equally great schools, who said, "Hey, you know, we're a public university, and let's we let the market discriminate. decide." Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and that still is the case to this day. I mean, we we are reacting to um, the philosophy of our schools. Um, but to your point, um, I think everybody could see that if you have. 70 headwear companies, ultimately, the, the, the point of difference is going to be price point. And that's not healthy for anybody. And so, um, you know, schools started um, narrowing the base of licensees a little bit. And, and then when you get into things like video games, where, you know, initially we had three football video games, Sony, Sega, and EA. We had two basketball games. And, you know, then EA and, and, and others start coming to us and saying, hey, we're prepared to really go all in in college, but it's going to be harder for us to do this if, um, you know, there's this many different companies and, and it becomes a price point issue and, and everything else. And so um, that's when, um, you know, product category management started kicking in and not only in video games, but in uh, in in lot in certain most of the apparel categories and trading cards and things like that. I've started to ask you about the most unusual <clears throat> product that someone brought to you to, to be licensed. I, I I remember going to a funeral for a friend who got buried in a Clemson casket. <laughs> and 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 literally in the back of the casket the tiger tail was coming out of the casket. And when they, it was a beautiful funeral service, but when they wheeled him out, they played the tiger rag. <laughs> right. So, right. So, so I don't, I'm not sure there's anything more unusual than a, than a logoed casket, but, but talk about some of the things that you saw over the years that, that, that people brought to you and wanted to have license. Yeah. Every Tuesday at 10 o'clock uh, is our non apparel review committee meeting. And, and that's where we go over all new applications And uh, we've seen some pretty wild stuff over the years, Um, you know, and the cradle to grave is a good example where we do all kinds of uh, things from pacifiers to car seats to to cribs all the way to urns and caskets and whatever else. Um, People ask that from time to time. What's the craziest thing? I I don't exactly know. There's a lot of I'll be honest. I've sort of given up on guessing which ones are going to work and which ones aren't. We, we licensed um, a musical bottle opener, and, and I said, "This is this is ridiculous. No one's going to buy this." <laughs> and you pop it off, and it plays the fight song. They wound up being a top ten licensee for three or four years. Every Ace Hardware you go to, you could find these things. So it, it's really hard to predict which ones are going to stick and which ones aren't. Yeah, well, that's why you got to try lots of different things. Yeah. You know, from that standpoint, I you know I think for a guy that. A, grew up in Denver, went to school in Ohio. You come down here, you know, the SEC's tagline is it just means more. I had somebody one time say to me, man, 
college football is kind of like a religion in the South. End. And I was like, oh, no, it's much more important than that. Uh, it, it's, uh, and so you just never, uh, you never underestimate what fans are going to buy. Um, that talks about the tribe that they belong to and all that kind of stuff. So um, let's talk a minute. <clears throat> We've now got NIL, name, image, and likeness. I was telling somebody the other day, I was kidding on my show with Wesley Haynes about, you know, what got SMU on the death penalty years ago is now legal. <laughs> right. Uh, and so we've come a long way. How is, and is it too early to tell, how are individual player rights going to intersect with licensing in your opinion? I think um, there's going to be a few categories that will be really positively impacted in, in a big way. And starting with video games, trading cards, jerseys, I think to a, a lesser extent, um, things like bobbleheads, um, fathead posters, um, when you go too much beyond that, I'm not certain it's going to be a big impact on our space because I just don't know that the demand is there for, you know, regular T-shirts, caps, drinkware, things like that. Um, but for those those categories that I mentioned, um, there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, I think you've read about the the one team CLC partnership. Yep. Um, where, you know, the, the, the vision is that um, one team will be communicating with these athletes and they'll have the ability to opt in, opt out into video games, trading cards, jerseys. Um, because if, if licensees need to, you know, work through lots of different agencies, it's, it's going to be difficult. Now, that may be the way that it, it is. Um, and if so, everyone's just going to have to adjust. But, um, I think over time, um, hopefully it'll be set up in such a way that, uh, licensees can manage it. Um, and, and everybody can, you know, really benefit. Are y'all doing anything in, 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 with NFTs? We're doing a lot with NFTs. Um, I'd never heard the acronym before March the 1st, um, ever since Rick, it's been, uh, just morning, noon and night. Uh, we, we've met with over 70 companies in the space. Um, we're, we're now um, licensed about seven companies. Stuff's just starting to hit the marketplace. Uh, it's a complicated category, particularly in college. It's very fragmented. Um, you know, some of the NFT companies, they tell us stories about working with Premier League soccer, and uh, you know they can they can write one check to Manchester United that gives them rights to broadcast video, athletes, photography, IP. Um, with college, those are four or five different phone calls, contracts, uh, systems, because you've got companies like Catapult and Veritone that manage the broadcast video rights. Companies like Getty in the photography space, um, when it comes to the athletes, obviously fragmented. Uh, and then we layer in the, the NIL complexities uh, even more. So it's uh, we're working our way through it. Um, and I think it's going to be a, an exciting space. Um, <clears throat> but in the short term, it's been pretty wild. Just just so many different companies coming out of the woodwork. And then you've got, I've seen some like electronic emojis, you know, with, you know, suddenly you've got, you know, mascots showing up on your smartphones right. in various things. Are y'all doing work in that, in that area too? Yeah, we've been working on that for a while. It's, it has honestly never been all that successful. It's, it's really hard to break into the, the Apple keyboard. In fact, nobody's able to do that. And so the company's have built these um, keyboards that you can import, but the the technology has been a, just a little bit difficult, and um, it hasn't caught on in a in a big big way. Unfortunately, we're going to keep working at it, but um, uh, that hasn't quite taken off like I think all of us envisioned that it might. What else are you working on that gets you excited right now? Well. Um, I mean, it's just a really dynamic time in the, in the overall uh, 
industry um, when you factor in, you know, all the exciting stuff going on with conference realignment and NIL and, um, you know, lots of big things happening on the, the fanatics front. Um, you know, I work in the trading card category and, um, you know, we're, we're working hard with Panini on the name image likeness piece right now. Um, so every day is different and that's one of the things I really enjoy about it. My brother's in the financial sector and he loves his job because he gets to learn a little bit about lots of different companies and industries. And I think I can relate in a, in a small way because one, one call is with a, a wristwatch company and these guys are just incredibly passionate about that space. And then the next phone calls with, you know, a sporting goods company. And uh, so I, I've been able to learn a little bit about a lot of different industries and uh, I really enjoy that part of it. You know, years ago <clears throat> when I uh, had an agency that, that, that Bill and Pat had a, 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 an equity position and, and Jim host had it and Chuck Jarvey, we spent a lot of time talking about promotional licensing and, and um, I, I still think promotional licensing is still undervalued. Um, you know, I understand about retail licensing, but the promotional licensing of school of, you know, brands doing promotions and giving away product. Um, I, I still think there's more upside there. Uh, would yeah. you, would you agree with that? I think so. Um, boy, we've worked <clears throat> at it and, and tried to make it work and we've had, you know, three, four, five different people running it at CLC. And, uh, I think we've, we've had, you know, every once in a while have a really great success story and you think that's going to lead to more. And then it, and then it, it, some of them haven't panned out quite as well. So, um, I think we've made some internal adjustments, um, to our systems that make it a little easier. And, and we've got a really great working relationship, obviously with our, our <clears throat> brothers and sisters at Learfield, uh, who, who they understand our role in the P so it's, um, I'm with you. I mean, we've been saying it for 10, 15 years that this ought to be a bigger piece of the overall pie. Uh, we'll keep working at it, but, um, to this point, it is a, a smaller piece of the, uh, overall equation. Yeah, I agree. Well, let's switch gears for a minute. I know you love the ponies. You love the horses. <laughs> I, I, I always see a lot of your social posts at, at the track and all this kind of stuff. Where'd that love come from? And, and talk a little bit about that. Well, I, I, it goes back to my grandfather, um, who loved horse racing. And, uh, I think at probably the age of six or so, uh, we started making bets on the Kentucky Derby. It was always the same $5 bill. And, um, and so I just, I've sort of followed the sport from a, from a young kid. Um, when I got to Atlanta, I, I found this book, um, lightning in a jar by a guy named Cot Campbell. We started Dogwood Stables, and um, I love the book. I wrote, caught a letter, and he invited me up to uh, his place in Aiken, South Carolina. And uh, I wound up, my, my first sort of big investment, I think I'm maybe 24 years old, I bought 22.5% of a, a touch gold colt named Tapster. I was so excited. Um, not only was Tapster slow, but he... Uh, got sick and the bills just kept coming. And I said, man, this is, I don't, I, <laughs> it's a hard business. <laughs> it's hard. So, um, and then I wind up, um, meeting and, and dating, uh, a girl from Louisville, Kentucky. And, uh, early on, um, she says, Hey, my, my family's going to the breeders cup. Uh, would you want to come? And I said, Oh my God. <laughs> and so we go out to the breeders cup and, uh, her, her, her name is Mary Jane Glasscock. Her, her parents, um, were in the horse racing space and, um, fast forward, they, they've gotten involved with, um, Starlight Racing and Mary Jane's brother is, is a real, um, super involved with Starlight as well. And we've had some really fun times. Uh, a lot of family vacations are at the track and, um, Starlight is a syndicate with about, 12 families, some really fun families. Um, they've got some great trainers. Todd Pletcher and Bob Baffert are probably their two main trainers. Yep. And um, so we, 
had some some fun success, <clears throat> including uh, 2018 Justify, who won the Triple Crown, um, and then figured that's a, surely a once in a lifetime thing. This will never happen again. And then 2020 Authentic wins the uh, the COVID Derby, and then wins goes on to win the Breeders' Cup Classic. Um, so it's just been a, a really fun family thing. I've got two daughters that are 16 and 13 now. So, you know, to be in the, the Kentucky Derby winner's circle with them, they were, you know, whatever, 10 and 7 at the time. Uh, it's just it's just been really a fun, a fun family outlet. I tell everybody that <clears throat> I've been to every sporting event in the world, and the Derby's my favorite. It, it's yeah. just Derby Day is just awfully special and – I will tell a funny story. My wife was uh, teaching first grade at Porter Goud, and there was a, you know, the parents in Charleston, you know, at a private school, you know, they can look down on, on teachers like second-class citizens and all this. And and so my wife and I are invited to the Derby that year, and, and we're on Millionaire's Row sitting with uh, Tim Fincham and, yep. and Tim Smith, who was then running the National Thoroughbred Racing Association, and the actor Elliot Gould and his wife sure. and Charlotte and me. You know, and Charlotte looks at me at one point and goes, "Why? Why are we here?" I mean, <laughs> I mean we, you know, but but we're there, and and this woman walks in and sees my wife and it was, does the double take, and and my wife just gave her the kind of the you know the the wave of a beauty queen, you know, and right. we, we had a great time, and and uh, and I've been I've had some success because I just bet Baffert horses. Uh, right. I, I, this is, I said, what I do. I just bet on everything Bob's got, and and it's turned out to be pretty fun. But as good as Churchill Downs is, I remind everybody that God bets on horses at Keeneland. Right. Keeneland right. is my favorite track. Um, yeah. It's just, like, special. Um, it really is. Yeah. I mean, it's just... I don't know. It's just, I guess, you know, you fly into the Lexington airport and you look down on Keeneland and you look down on all the horse farms and all that. It's really thing, but it's turned to, it's, you've turned a hobby into a great business uh, opportunity, but it's, it, you know, like you said, it's something your family can be part of and, uh, and, and, and leads to a lot of great memories and all that. I want to close by though, talking about another project that you did that, Hey, I'm really proud of you, but I want to know how you got involved in this thing. You were, were one of the executive producers of the, the CNN special on Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter, rock and roll president. Tell me about how that whole thing came about. It really was a, a crazy series of unlikely events, um, where, um, I was having lunch with, uh, a mentor of mine and a guy named Tom Beard who was in the Carter administration. And I, I said, Tom, have you ever been to the Sunday school classes in Plains? And he said, no, I have never been. He said, I said, you've got to do this. So this isn't going to go on forever. And he says, if, if I could, you know, put that together, would you want to come with me? And so, um, a small group of us went to Plains, um, not only to go to Sunday school, but we had dinner with the Carters the night before. And that was just so great. And, and much of the dinner conversation wound up being about music. And uh, they were, I was so nervous going into it. And they, they just could not be any more approachable and easy. And it just was great. And then unrelated to that, um, I wound up having dinner with two documentary guys in Atlanta who were hoping to do a documentary on the Allman Brothers. And they had spent the day in Macon meeting with Greg Allman's manager, and he wanted the project to be just about Greg. And they said, no, we were really the visions for the whole band and the whole history. And so they're sort of at a stalemate. They were coming to Atlanta to meet with some guys that were going to talk about President Carter's relationship with the Allman brothers. And um, as they're telling the story, and this is Peter Conlon, who's a great. Yep, I know um, Peter. Yep, and and uh, and then Tom Beard, and and they say, you know, the Allman Brothers is just one piece of the story here. You know, there's there's Jimmy Buffett, Willie Nelson, um, Garth Brooks, and and so, and then we went on to dinner. Uh, those guys, and, and they started to say, hey, maybe we need to sort of put the the Almonds project on the side burner and uh let's focus on this jimmy carter story there's 
a lot of, you know, people are going to be shocked to hear these deep relationships. So it was a really cool dinner. I have, I have no background in this space, but, um, I love music and I love the Carters and, and my friend Todd Smith. We were just, as we took those guys back to the hotel and drove back home, it was like, wouldn't it be a riot if we could somehow stay involved with this? Um, and then, uh, the next steps, I mean, I, I won't go into all of it, but, you know, sending a letter to the Carters, uh, seeking their permission to do an authorized piece. Will they sit down for two interviews, one in Plains, one in Atlanta? Um, you know, the, the proceeds will go to the Carter Center. Um, that gets approved. And then um, we're sort of off to the races. They start shooting the interviews. Um, and Todd and I, our role at that point was was likely to be raising money um, and, and helping on the communication side. Um, we had a, a hard time raising the money. We had quite a few things get down to the five yard line and they'd fall apart. And um, we got to a point where the project is either going to happen or not, but we've got to, you know, we've got directors, cinematographers we need to start editing the editing process and so at that point, I said, um, I'm going to step in and, and take a bigger role on the financial side. I started uh, Thunder Moccasin Pictures and, um, and wound up sort of uh, with, with a couple other people, you know, funding the project. Um, and so, you know, the, the credit to the content goes all to Mary Wharton, the director, who's just done some amazing things, Chris Farrell, the producer, and, and others. But... Uh, then we're in the process of making the movie, but then it gets into the, the sales process, the, 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 fil the festival process. Um, I really learned a lot. It was about a 40 month project. I'm really happy with the way it turned out. Um, we lost a little money, but not a lot. And uh, I think if it weren't for COVID, we would have made money, but we came out in September of 2020 when no one's going to the movie theaters. Uh, we were selected as the, the uh, premiere movie at Tribeca, which was just going to be a riot, red carpet, Beacon Theater, 3,000 people, April of 2020. Mm. And that got uh, COVIDed out. And that so we'll never know. That was, that was going to be one of the five best nights of my life. Um, but regardless, like I said, we, we really uh, had a lot of fun and learned a lot. And uh, I'm just so proud that we could tell that story um, because – it's very rewarding for people to come up and say, hey, I had no idea about President Carter. I, all I, you know, I'm too young for that. I uh, just know, you know, I thought his president supposedly didn't work out and probably a good guy. But wow, there's a lot more to him as a man. His presidency actually was ahead of its time in many respects. And, and then just the music piece. Uh, we have 42 songs in there. So if you like Yalman Brothers and Marshall Tucker and these guys, you'll enjoy the movie because it's a, it's a toe tapper from start to finish. You know, so many things came out of it for me. Number one, it brought back so many memories. I'm, you know, I'm a, he was the first guy I voted for, for president. Uh, I'm a Georgia boy. I get to vote for a Georgia governor for president of the United States. And I remember the Allman Brothers, you know, when I was in high school, I went to high school in Cab County. Uh, they played free concerts in Piedmont Park. On, on Sunday Amazing. afternoons. I mean, and I remember seeing Jimmy Buffett at the Great Southeast Music Hall uh, in Broadview Plaza, which was a little club that doesn't exist anymore. And, and I became a huge Buffett fan at that point and have been for the rest of my life. I, I remember one night going to the Broadview Plaza, and this was a place, you know, I was 18 and you could drink beer. You know, right. Georgia was an 18-year-old state. My little brother, you know, he was three years younger than me, and he couldn't drink beer, but he looked old. And and we would go to the Great Southeast Music Hall together and and drink beer. Um, and, 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 and we didn't care who was there. And, and one night, I think it was the summer of 71, we go in there, and there's a band called the Rolling Thunder Review Band. And, and I, never heard, <laughs> I never heard of them. I mean, you know, it, right. it, it didn't matter. And then out comes Bob Dylan and Joan Baez and Roger McGuinn and – I'm like, oh shit! This they were playing incognito shows around the country that that summer, 
And, you right. know, and this is the seven o'clock show. And I tell my brother, go to the bathroom now because we're not getting up. We're, yeah. we're, we're going to be here for the 10 o'clock show. And of course, this is pre cell phones, but somehow the word got out. There was nobody there at the seven o'clock show. By the 10 o'clock show, the fire marshal's trying to shut the place down. You know, it's that kind of thing. So it just brought back so many memories. But one of the great takeaways was Jimmy Carter may be the least judgmental human being on the planet. And you had that wonderful story of when Greg Allman really got railroaded into, you know, stay out of jail by turning on everybody else. Um, right. And had been ostracized. And yet Jimmy was, his, he was Jimmy's friend. And, and, yeah. and, 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 and Jimmy gets elected and Greg spends the night in the White House. I love that. Yeah. I love that yeah. story. And that's the essence of Jimmy Carter. I mean, yeah. that God just sees the good in everybody. And it's almost like he just doesn't see any of the bad. It, it's yeah. And and, and yeah, y'all, did, y'all did such a great job of telling that story. Yeah, thank you. I, that was a delicate part of the movie, and uh, Mary really worked hard on that. Um, but I, I do think that uh, that it came across well. And then Chip told part of the story, Jimmy's son, and he talked about the fact that he he had his issues. And his, his dad really didn't judge him ultimately, you know, he, he's more focused on, are you, are you a good person? Are you trying to do the right things? If you've got some challenges, um, you know, I'm, I'm prepared to work my way through that. As long as you've got, you know, your, your eyes in the right place. Um, I, 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 he really is a super unique person and, uh, just to, thrill of a lifetime to develop a, a bit of a friendship with him. Well, I kind of like that first scene where he says, you know, Willie Nelson in his autobiography writes about smoking a joint in the White House with a, with, with someone who worked at the White House. And, and that's not true. He, he actually smoked <laughs> that joint with my son, with <laughs> you know, with Jeff. And, I, and it, just the way he tells it, I mean, it's just so disarming. And, uh, and you think about, you think about the, the, the last couple of years we've had with, you know, the racial issues. Jimmy Carter's colorblind. Yeah. Just totally colorblind. And, you know, and y'all captured that. You know, the artists that, that played for him and helped him were across every spectrum of the music industry because he just had a unique way. And, boy, we could use some of that right now. Yeah, I mean, we, we yeah, we, it was we, neat that the, yeah. the the movie came out on January third, twenty twenty one, um, or twenty twenty twenty. Yeah, um, and so uh, you know, the country was really in a pretty bizarre place. Um, the plan was to show it again January ninth. Uh, this was on CNN, but uh, that got preempted because of all the January sixth stuff. Um, but it, it was a, without really coming out and saying it, um, there's some pretty stark differences between his style of leadership and, uh, and what we were wrestling with, uh, the last four years. No, there's no question about it. Are you, are you going to do any more documentaries? Are there any more in your, uh, in I your, don't in know. Your future? I, that, some, as a result of the project, I've, I've met a lot of interesting people and, um, um, I've had some interesting conversations, nothing in the pipeline right now. Honestly, we're working towards um, this EA Sports College football game with the goal of coming out in July of 2023. And that's almost like building a movie. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. No, no, I get it. I get it. <laughs> I, I mean, no, no. And that's going to have such a dramatic impact. That's got that's got school revenue implications. It's got certainly NIL revenue implications uh, it's probably the single biggest thing you could be doing for the ecosystem right now. So I know that's taking a, a lot of your time. Well, listen, I appreciate you've been gracious with your time today. You've had a phenomenal career and you're not done yet. Um, and it is an exciting time right now in the collegiate licensing business with all of the, in some cases, with all the turmoil, it creates opportunities. And um, Dave, I can't thank you enough for being with us today from the bridge. Well, Rick, I appreciate you saying that, and uh, you have been a, just a great friend and career mentor, and uh, I'm grateful for that. And I'm grateful that you've taken on this this podcast because I'm working my way through them. These are really important interviews with interesting people, and they're there for the rest of time. 
and uh, it's really a service to the whole industry. So I, I want to thank you for, for your leadership on that front as well. well. I appreciate that. And we'll talk soon, buddy. See you. Let me give you yet another one man's opinion from the old soapbox. Hey, you may not agree with me, but again, it's my soapbox and not yours. We've talked a lot about licensed products today, and one thing I laugh at is the grown-up who wears a jersey with the name and number of a professional athlete. I absolutely cringe at those. You know, the 4-foot, 11-inch guy wearing a LeBron jersey simply makes me laugh. Maybe he wears it because someone might ask him to come out of the stands and play. Well, probably not. I just don't get it. I like wearing the team marks, but not player marks. I guess that's why I like college sports so much, because the name on the front of the jersey is more important than the name on the back of the jersey. And that's my view from the soapbox. Let's close with another place to eat on the road with Rick. Uh, We're currently all watching to see who might get the Southern Cal head football coaching job. And it's a hard job. In fact, it's not the job that it used to be. You know, years ago when John McKay was at uh, Southern Cal, he had 19 junior colleges in California alone that played football, and it was easy to tap into that uh, talent pool each and every year. Plus, you had a very robust uh, high school football uh, ecosystem in California. Well, not anymore. Those 19 junior colleges, none of them play football anymore. And there are a whole lot of mamas not letting their babies play football in California these days. I think that is a very tough job. Uh, But whoever gets that job needs to go eat at Philippe's in L.A. Philippe's is the home of the French dip sandwich. They have all kinds of dip sandwiches. Sandwiches prepared and then dipped in au jus. They have lamb, pork, turkey, ham, and even pastrami. But what you want is the beef dip. It's thinly cut roast beef on a French roll with a choice of cheese. Get the provolone. You can have it single dipped, double dipped, or completely wet. I like double dipped. Grab a side of coleslaw and potato salad, kosher dill pickle, and a draft beer. Great for celebrating wins or licking your wounds after a loss. It's Philippe's on North Alameda in Los Angeles, California, on the road with Rick. I hope you enjoyed the show today with my special guest, Dave Kirkpatrick, and I hope you'll join us again next week from the Brits.